um, from Jesus' arrest. Uh, the pictures are all taken at a church called um, St. Peter of Galen, Galen Cantu, which I may be pronouncing wrong, uh, that sits on the site where um, Caiaphas, the high priest's house, was and where Jesus would have been uh, imprisoned the first night that he was arrested after um, being in the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, and it's the place where Peter denies Jesus, which is why it's given its name. These are the doors to the church, which I just thought um, were beautiful, so I took a picture of them. Uh, so you'll see the next picture is inside. This is in the, uh, it's uh, three levels of a church, and the top level has a hole where you can see down into the bottom where um, the um, prison cells would have been. So you're looking from the sanctuary down into the bottom basement of the church where the prison cell would be. The next picture uh, is uh, a picture of um, one of the cells that they are um, th think are from the first century. And if you look, there's it's hard to see the way this picture is, but these are steps down. And what would have happened is they would have taken the prisoner down the steps to the bottom level where the two black squares are, and they would have grabbed them by the hand and lowered them down into the prison cell, which you can imagine is pretty, pretty painful to have happen. If you go to the next picture, I think it's another picture of, um, of an example of a cell. It's very small. This is the one that you would see um, from the top, from that first picture I showed you. you go to the next one. Another example of the cell. And I think there's one more of the cell. This is one that they had um, behind glass that were a couple different ones together, all from the first century. The, um, ne this picture is um, what, a piece of what they call the Roman road. It's the first century road that led from Caiaphas' house down to Pontius's uh, palace where Jesus was then sent to be crucified. So you're looking at steps from the first century uh, which I just thought were amazing. So they would have walked down into the city from where they were. And I think one more is a statue. This is a statue commemorating um, G uh, Peter's denial of Jesus. So you see Peter sitting at the base um, with a Roman soldier behind him and then um, two servant girls on the side who are asking him if, um, if he was one of Jesus' disciples and Peter says no. And then, of course, you have the rooster um, crowing at the top. So, on Palm and Passion Sunday, we welcome Jesus with sincerity and abandon, but sometimes, as I said, we do not know or we simply forget what he requires of us afterwards. Proclaiming the one riding a donkey as king means following a king who will strive for healing and peace even when the cost is unimaginable. As Jesus entered into Jerusalem, there arrived with him a new ordering of the world, a redistribution of power. The high will be brought down and the low will be lifted up. The first shall be last and the last shall be first. This, Jesus says, is the way of God's peace. It comes in a way that we rarely suspect and is beautiful to behold, but it comes only on the other side of horrible and dreadful things. It comes with a price. Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem is a signal to us that trouble is coming. The truth is that despite society's penchant for violent movies, most of us get very uncomfortable talking about Good Friday. We don't want to spend time on it. We like maybe um, a quick reference to Jesus dying for our sins, but we like to kind of smooth past it because it makes us a little uncomfortable. We're happy to spend time envisioning the joy of Palm Sunday or the good news of the resurrection, but we want to often look away when it comes to that Friday. The problem is, though, if we look away, we miss that trouble and pain is not all that comes on that Good Friday. If we look away, we miss the rest. I want to think for just a minute about the crowds that were around Jesus in his last few days during the events between his triumphal entry into Jerusalem and his death. I think that we can put them into a few categories. The first is the users. These are the people who just wanted something from Jesus, right? The ones who wanted only a military messiah, the ones who wanted only a healing, or who followed him for their own personal miracle, their own idea of political transformation. Even some of the disciples get caught up in this category. We would probably put Judas in there, right? Or James and John who spend time arguing about who will sit on his right and left in heaven. Are you part of this category? 
following Jesus just so that you can get what you want and need. The second group, I think, that surrounded Jesus in those days were the abusers. These are the ones that uh, were threatened by Jesus, who hate his message of forgiveness and repentance and change and just want him gone. These are the ones who are angry or scared of the radical message that Jesus preaches and embodies, are scared of the way that it disrupts the status quo and the distribution of power. This group would include the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the powerful, the ones whose agendas were at risk in the work Jesus was doing. This is the group that doesn't want Jesus to rock the boat or to make changes that are a little too big. Have you ever been part of this group? Finding your way of life threatened because following Jesus meant really changing your priorities. The third group are the unawares. In my imagination, I think that this group is probably the largest group. These are the ones who didn't wave palm branches as Jesus entered into Jerusalem. They were too busy taking care of their own day-to-day lives to be worried about what some wannabe Messiah figure was doing. They weren't at the temple for the cleansing or a part of the debates because they were just busy with life. These are the ones who would have said, oh yeah, I heard about something like that on TV, on the news, but then go back to the everydayness of life. Are you a part of this group? Unaware of what God is doing because you've let yourself get too busy, maybe even conveniently sticking your head in the sand so that you don't have to worry or be a part of disrupting the status quo to bring about change. The fourth group were the gratefuls. These are the people that Jesus has healed, the ones that he's redeemed, the people who throughout the Gospels proclaim his identity as Messiah, his power, his grace, even in the face of incredible opposition. These are the people who would, to steal a phrase from the hit show Scandal, follow him off a cliff. Because their lives have been so radically transformed by his love that they can do nothing else. Are you a part of this group? Have you come to know Jesus in a way that has changed your present life? A way that prevents you from going back to the way things used to be? The truth is that most of us have been a part of all of these groups at some time in our lives, and even those named in the Gospels weren't a part of just one group. It could be that there were some believers who moved into the abusers group as they grew frustrated with Jesus' turn-the-other-cheek theology, or maybe some who started out as users in it just for what they could get were moved into the grateful group because of their encounter with Christ. We aren't just one group, and sometimes I think we straddle two of them at the same time, not quite ready to commit with our whole selves. Now here's what I love about the Good Friday story, what we miss if we skip over it too quickly. With his last breath, Jesus was still reordering lives and relationships. If you remember, even from the cross, he turned to Mary and John and asked them to care for one another, saying, here is your mother and here is your son. He turned to the thieves beside him and offered them grace, moving them from one group, the users maybe, to the gratefuls. He spoke words of forgiveness to the very ones who abused and beat him, offering them a chance to change. His kingdom is being ushered in even now, even when Jesus is at his weakest, even when it looks like all is lost. This is the good news we see on Good Friday. The reason we call it good and use that word triumphant, because all of our hopes, all of our expectations that often lie shattered at our feet, through Jesus' death on Good Friday, now lie safe and secure in the hands of the one who will cleanse them from sin and fulfill them beyond our imagining. That's what God offers us in those moments. In these moments, as he stretches out his arms, he offers to gather all of us in. He offers a chance to give up our expectations, our ideas about how God should work, to let go of the shadows that hold us so that we might begin to see and live into the light of new life. On Good Friday, the powers that be thought that they had triumphed over this false prophet Jesus once and for all. They thought they had finally silenced him. They had finally won. And there are moments in each of our lives when it seems like evil has in fact won. That the very worst thing has happened. The shadow of triumph, though, reminds us that the worst thing is never the last thing. 
that God is more powerful than anything we encounter in this life, that God's kingdom is being ushered in even now, and that the dawn will come. It's not all that surprising that hardly any churches have Good Friday reenactments. It's not just that we want to turn away or look anywhere but there. It's that we aren't so sure that this is a story we want to be a part of. The truth is that resurrection is costly, that new life requires a form of death. It requires us to let go of the old so that it can be transformed into the new and abundant life that God offers. Perhaps, instead of waving palm branches and shouting hosannas, what we really need to do is find ourselves at the foot of the cross, following Jesus to the end. And it is there that we'll discover his kingdom has come and that abundant life starts now. So what will your answer be? Will you let Jesus reorder your life, our life, with his last breath? These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.